everyone well welcome to the second episode of oh my gods so last week we went over the 2004 movie troy as a way of explaining like what triggered me into getting into greek mythology and like how my interest started but now we're going to go through an actual original greek myth so no more brad pitt this week I think the best place to start everything is always at the beginning, so we're going to go all the way back to the very beginning of the universe. So theogeny literally means the genealogy of a group or system of gods, and it comes from the two Greek words theos meaning god and gonia meaning beginning or birth. But just like Greek mythology, pretty much every polytheistic religion has a theogony that describes how their gods were created or ascended to power. The main piece of work that goes over how all the gods came to be and what individual piece of the universe they have domain over is by the just as famous as Homer, Greek poet Hesiod. And the poem is rightly titled Theogony. So even though we'll mainly be talking about what's described in this poem, other details from other ancient texts that go over the creation of the universe as well, even if they are only tiny pieces, are also going to be included here. This poem has a little over a thousand lines of text and it came out around the same time as Homer was writing the Iliad, so sometime around 700-ish BC. And although the creation of the universe is mentioned in many other works, another source that is used as a reference is this play by Aristophanes, The Birds. But it is only briefly mentioned here as a means of explaining why birds, like actual real birds, are the true gods who were also betrayed by the current 12 Olympians. Until they add the birds into the family tree, they are explaining how the universe formed and gave birth to the earth. And that's what I mean by the very beginning. We're taking things back to before there even were things. In Greek theogony, there are a lot of gods that are personifications of eternal cosmic elements, like the earth and the sky and night. But there are many things that are just a part of life that got gods to represent them. And we'll talk about all those personifications together later on too. So because there are a lot of gods and titans and figures and creatures that are all vital parts of the creation of the universe, this episode is getting split into two parts. So let's get started on part one. BT Dubs episode one was super duper long, and that was not my intention. Like, it was crazy long. But it was the first, and it was about a three-hour movie. So now I'm kind of thinking that the episodes that are about books and movies are going to be on the longer side of things, which I guess I can live with because like there is so much to go over. Some people do like super short episodes once a month and I guess we'll do super long ones for now and maybe super short ones too just to keep things interesting. Now Hesiod's full work will actually be the topic of an episode later on in May, so here we're just going to dive straight on into the family ancestry, and then after that we'll get to the succession myth, and then talk about everyone's favorite Olympians. So before the Olympians took over reign of the universe, in came their parents and grandparents and sometimes great-grandparents. These are the first gods. They are referred to as the primordial deities or the protogenai. Protos meaning first and genos meaning born. And is used to describe the first order of any deities. These immortal or deathless gods are used to lay the foundation of all things, literally. They act as the personification of many of the basic principles of the universe. The ones that we can touch and feel every day and even the ones we can only feel like emotionally. Most of these gods are not worshipped actively in the stories that revolve around mythology, but they are very important to set the stage to literally everything. Verily at first, chaos, the gap, came to be. But next, wide-bosomed Gaia, Earth, and dim Tartaros, the pit, in the depth of the wide-pathed Earth. And Eros, love, 
fairest among the deathless gods, who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. So in the beginning, there was nothing. Nothingness, I guess. This was chaos, in Greek meaning the abyss. And he represented the void, darkness slash confusion, or just the emptiness that existed before the creation of the universe. In Hesiod's version, chaos represented both the emptiness of the vast universe as well as the bottomless chasm that is Tartarus, in the underworld. He is described as both, so the void is a good way to think about what he is meant to represent. In The Birds, which is a comedic play, Chaos, who is still supposed to be the void, and Eros, the god of love and sexual desire, are the parents of all the birds. So do what you will with that tidbit of information for now. So after Chaos, in comes Earth, represented through the motherly figure of Gaia. She was not created by Chaos, but rather just kind of formed like he did. But it gets a little confusing when you look at family trees because they're usually placed a little line below him leading to her because she came after him, but he's not her father. Chaos has his own offspring, but she is not one of them. Now, that is Hesiod's explanation of her birth. In other sources, she does have parents, and they do differ from source to source. So in one of them, she's the daughter of Hemera and Aether, and in another, she emerged from Hydros, the primordial god of water. But Gaia's kind of a little bit more of a self-explanatory kind of deity because she represents something that's more tangible, the earth. She's the mother of all creation, bearing a majority of the other primordial immortals that are going to be introduced here. And she's also a little bit of a troublemaker when it comes to the other gods backing her into a corner. When things were first getting laid out, the depiction of Gaia varied a little bit. Sometimes she's shown as an old lady who is still part of the earth, like coming out of the ground, but got stuck halfway. But even though she is an old lady, she's still shown to be like a motherly figure. But other images of the primordial goddess paint her as more of a youthful form. Hesiod described her as the wide-bosomed earth, and this semblance is consistently repeated now. Pretty much every image represents her as a full-figured woman dressed in the lush color green and is in constant contact with the earth itself. And that makes sense. But in Greek cosmology, which is the science of the origin and development of the universe that was sort of concreted later on by Plato during the Age of Thinkers, which was post-Homer and Hesiod. But before Plato and others decided that the earth was probably round, it was understood by pretty much every culture that the earth was a flat disk. And in ancient Greek cosmology, the flat earth was surrounded by water encased in a dome that was the heavens. And under the earth was the underworld or Tartarus. And all of this was propped up on the pillars of earth. And even though the earth is called flat, They still go on to describe her as a physical woman who has the seas and mountains sitting on her bosom. So like I said, she has a lot of children. And there are even tribes of humans that are considered her offspring as well. But before we can get to them, we have to get to her lovers. And they are also her relatives. And sometimes her children. But they are the first family, so there's not many people to mate with yet. Plus, it's ancient Greek mythology, so incest is kind of normal among the gods. Um, Quick little thing to point out, even though there is a lot of incest in these mythological stories, that doesn't mean that incest was like running rampant in IRL ancient Greeks. The gods in these legends are used more as like ways to explain things that happen and the reason things exist and that's why a lot of them seem like not the best people um they have like good and bad characteristics and i guess that makes them more interesting than having just a group of nice people there's no drama and then there's no explanation for the not so nice things that happen to mankind either so they're not good they're not bad they're just there Anyways, moving on after Gaia, next is Tartarus, which is the primordial god of the stormy pit that lies beneath the flat earth disk. 
forming the bottom dome. It's the opposite of the sky, which is supposed to be a dome. This is the pit in which the Titans will be imprisoned later on. This pit is sometimes confused with the underworld itself because, I mean, I'll even admit, I used to think they were the same place. The word has been used to mean the underworld, so over time its meaning technically did become blurred, but it's meant to represent the deepest part of the earth, like as far away from the underworld as the earth is from heaven. But this confusion is not that far off base. Tartarus also started to be described as a place where the worst of the worst of mankind have their spirits punished for eternity. So it kind of takes on like the deepest part of the underworld vibe. Welcome to the underworld. So a common thing is even though he's considered a deity, he's actually not represented as an anthropomorphic being, but rather just a pit itself. A lot of the other primordial gods are also like this. They are parts of the world and are usually represented as such instead of having a human body, but they're still discussed as if they were people. So like everything else, there's a lot of different versions. So even the very depths of hell can have a very confusing family tree because Hesiod's version says that the pit has no parents and rather like the earth and the void just came into existence when the universe formed. But if you look elsewhere, it will say that someone birthed into existence this pit of darkness. So after Tartarus, next up is Eros. Everybody loves him because he's the primordial god of love and sexual desire. And that's what his name means, desire. Fairest among all the deathless gods, who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsel of all gods and all men's within them. I think it's kind of cute that he's the first emotional deity that comes into being, but I think it also is more because he also represents like reproduction, which is sort of needed to start creating the future generations of the gods and then eventually mankind, but it's still kind of cute. And he is also probably the first of the gods whose backstory is conflicting in like the common understanding of his existence because both versions are widely accepted. So for instance, here he's clearly marked out as one of the first beings to ever exist. He's a quintessential part of the universe. So like he came before pretty much everybody else. The only thing that existed before him was nothingness, right? So that's what's mentioned in most versions of Greek theogony. But that starts to unravel later on when he's described as the son of Aphrodite and Ares. But obviously that difference leads to two very different stations in the grand scheme of the universe. Because Aphrodite is created by... Eros's nephew, I guess, when his blood falls into the ocean, according to the storyline that has followed in Hesiod. So it becomes like a chicken and an egg thing with these two. Then next there's Erebus. Unlike the other three we just went over, Erebus is actually often described as actually being born from chaos somehow. Erebus is the primordial god of darkness, but not night. Keep that in mind, it will come up in like a second. But so he's also meant to have been born from the void, and then he marries his sister, Nyx, who is the personification of night. So he is the god of darkness and also has a realm over the underworld because that's where his sad, dark, and gloominess thrives. His darkness sinks into the hollow chasms of the earth and fills up the underworld, which is his realm. So like I just said, Erebus has a sister wife, Nyx, who was also birthed out of the void, but not the same way as the other primordial gods. Chaos has actually considered her father or parent as well. Nyx is the goddess of night. She carries her veil of dark mists across the sky, covering up the bright blue air of the day and concealing it with darkness. And you would assume that a hardcore female deity would get worshipped like crazy, the same way that like the moon is worshipped, but she actually followed the same path as the majority of the other primordials and was not really given that much attention, even though she definitely deserves it. There are no temples built for her, and the statues that do exist are few and far between. When she is mentioned, it's usually as a background element of a cult. 
I know we haven't mentioned Zeus yet, so like he doesn't exist technically yet, but Nyx was the only immortal that the king of the gods actually feared. According to Hesiod, these are the first five after chaos. They were all born in conjunction with the creation of the universe and are the basic fundamental pieces of the universe itself. So the very last of the first gen is kind of like why sometimes it's considered a vowel, sometimes it's not. But it makes sense for him to be one of the first to emerge from the nothingness because he kind of dictates everything else. Of course, I'm talking about Kronos, not to be confused with Kronos, the Titan, who is not cool. He's bad, but who isn't, right? But Kronos is the primordial god of time and eternity, the father time character opposite of mother nature. He is also often personified as a man or like, as a serpent creature with three heads, one human, one of a bull, and one of a lion. But everyone usually thinks of him as an old man with a long white beard when they picture Father Time. And that's not a coincidence. Depiction of him as this elderly man started during the Imperial Roman era. So he either appeared at the creation of the universe similar to the other gods we just went over, which I think makes the most sense. Okay. So now it's time to move on to the children of the first primordials. I know Nyx and Erebus are technically the children of chaos, but like, you know what I mean, hopefully. So first we'll continue with the family that's already forming. The dating pool at the creation of the universe was kind of small. So Nyx and Erebus, brother and sister and husband and wife, have a nice little family. And it produced two children together, Ether the god representing the upper sky, and Hemera, the goddess of the day. Similar to their parents, the two children work together in their respective responsibilities and would bring an end to the darkness of night. Hemera would remove her mother's dark mists from the earth, revealing the bright blue sky of her brother. Now you may be thinking, wait, I thought the sun god was the personification of the day. But no, not really. So in ancient Greek myths, even though the sun god is considered to have direct domain over the day, it is not he who ushers it in. It is more like he's just a product of the day. Also following in their footsteps, the two siblings are also husband and wife, and depending on who you ask, have children of their own. And it really depends who you ask, because if you were to ask Hyginus, a Roman poet, then he would tell you that Hemera and Ether gave birth to their great aunt Gaia, and two of their uncles. But after Nyx and Erebus had two kids together that were both kind of the opposites of them, like goth parents with preppy kids, Nyx clearly blamed Erebus for the incompatible children and started reproducing on her own. And she went crazy. So alone, Nyx gave birth to like 16 additional kids that all represented much darker things than fresh air and daytime. First up is Moros the personification of doom, who drove people to their fated deaths, the unseen force that was behind the physical death caused by his siblings. Following him is the Onoroi, the spirits of dreams. Rather than being personified as human beings, instead, these were dark-winged spirits that would also appear at night like a swarm of bats from their cave in the land of eternal darkness. There were apparently two types of dreams that these spirits would bring. The dreams from the gods that revealed prophecies, and the second was false dreams with no meaning at all. In another source, Ovid's Metamorphoses, these spirits of dreams are considered the children of sleep, and here he mentions a few of the spirits by name. There's Morpheus, Isolus, or Fovitor, and I love the name Fovitor, and Phantasis. Morpheus is considered the leader of the Onoroi, who acted as the messenger of the gods that could appear to kings in their dream as a form of humans. It kind of makes me want to watch The Matrix again after even just mentioning him. Isolus slash Fovitor is the shaper of dreams that go to men. Apparently, the gods call him Isolus, but mankind calls him Fovitor, which is much better to me. And lastly, there's Phantasis, who kind of gets the shaft a little bit, but he's the personification of inanimate objects in prophetic dreams. Moving on, then there's the Keters. 
They are the evil spirits of cruel and violent death. Yikes. These female spirits are often associated with battle, murder, and plague. They worked as agents of the Mire and were bloodthirsty and vicious. They would rip the souls out of the mortals' dead bodies and bring them to the underworld. Next, there is a daughter who is a personification of discord, strife, or rivalry, Eris. And she is a troublemaker as well. We mentioned her very briefly last week as the one who tosses the golden apple that leads to the goddesses bribing Paris over who is the fairest of them all. But that's because none of the gods like her that much, so that's what you get for being so unpleasant, I guess. Momos is a personification of blame, mockery, ridicule, and harsh criticism. He also got kicked out of heaven because he was so mean to the other gods. The nicest of her solo kids is Philates, the personification of friendship and affection. Aww. Her name means possibly two things in Greek, so she's also considered to be the god of sex as well, but she's definitely not the most prominent sex god. After that, there's Jairus, the personification of old age, and he's an old, frail man. And even though you might think he's pretty neutral, but no, he's a malevolent old man. Probably upset that he's so old. Next, there's a couple gals you may recognize, the Morai. Darling, hold that mortal's thread of life good and tight. or better known as the Fates, a gang of sisters that all have their own job to do as a personification of the inescapable fate slash destiny of mankind. There's Clotho, the spinner, Leches, the allotter, and Atropos, the unturnable, a metaphor for death. Uh, she's the one who cuts the thread when it's time for the mortals to die. Then there's Nemesis, whose name means dispenser of dues. She's a personification of retribution or envy. She was in charge of keeping everything fair and equal. No one was supposed to get away with evil deeds, but they also weren't supposed to have too much good fortune. And then there's the Hesperides, the goddess nymphs or minor goddesses of the evening and the golden light of sunset. They are also the guardians of the tree that bears golden apples, and the golden apples are supposed to be the golden light that you see at sunset. Next up, there's Thantanos, not Thanos, the personified spirit or daemon of death. Well, actually gentle death. He is described in other texts as the one who helps men get away from the pain, sorrow, and suffering of life on earth. Even though he's a god of destruction, the death that he brings is usually described as being like his twin brother, Hypnos, the god of sleep. So he's the good god of death, not like his other siblings who are the gods of terrible, horrible deaths. So moving on directly from him though to the twin brother of death, and that again is Hypnos, the god of sleep. He's also personified as a young man, usually seen holding poppies, and the Onoroi were either his brothers or his sons. Next, there is Oasis, the goddess of hardship, misery, woe, distress, and suffering. Just like all of the sucky stuff. And she's another one of the really bad children of Nyx. And finally, the last of the single mother's children is her daughter, Apate, the personified spirit representing deceit or fraud. She can usually be found hanging out with the god of lies and trickery, obviously. Jeez. That is a huge family, and we're not even anywhere near done. There's still all the children that these children have, and then that the other prim original primordials have, and their children, so there's still a lot more to go over. So this is where we are right now on the family tree so far. There's still a lot of children that we need to get to, but if you think these guys are interesting, you should hear all about all the kids that these beings slash natural elements bring into the universe. So at the top, we have Chaos, the very first being. Then under him, we have Gaia, the Earth, Tartarus, Stormy Pit, 
Eros, love and sexual desire, Erebus, darkness, Nyx, night, and Kronos, time slash eternity. Then under Erebus and Nyx, we have their two children, Hemera and Aether, and then of course all of the darker children that Nyx then had on her own, Moros, Doom, Onoroi, Dreams, Keras, Death Spirits, Eris, Discord, Momos, Blame, Philites, Friendship, Jeras, Old Age, Thantanos, Death, Morai, Fate, Nemesis, Retribution, The Hesperides, Daughters of the Night, Hypno, Sleep, Oasis, Hardship, and Apate, Deceit. And this is like still such a small portion of the chart. We still have to jump over to the other parentless primordials and go through like all the children of Gaia and Tartarus, plus all of like the grandchildren and so on. Primordials aren't really given the same spotlight as the Olympians, but they also don't have as many wild stories as the gods like Zeus. But I think that the story of the creation of everything is usually pretty interesting, especially in the case of Greek mythology, because it's like everyone has their own little task or domain to look over and take care of. The personification of everyday things like the rivers or the night sky, along with emotions and feelings like love and strife, as well as conceptual things like time or blame. It all kind of puts like greater meaning to everything that goes on. And I think that's was part of the purpose that they had for laying it out, like kind of to help them get an understanding of it, but then put some bigger emphasis on The personification of everyday things like the river or the night sky, along with emotions and feelings like love and strife, as well as conceptual things like time or memory. I think it all kind of puts everything into like a larger, I mean, I get that they were doing it to probably have a way of understanding why these things were happening to them and what was going on and what the purpose of it all was, but I think it's kind of sweet where it makes it kind of like it's well it is still in your control but like there's outside forces that are leading to it i don't know i just think it's nice thinking that there's a god of time and a god of memory and a god of discord and there's a reason behind why maybe something's going really well for you or something's going not that great for you and like thinking of being so taken care of in the afterlife i think it's just all really sweet and i I totally get why they did this and that's probably why i'm so into it but anyways okay so for this week to win the free oh my god's t-shirt this is the question for the contest who is the main parentless primordial that is not mentioned in hesiod's theogeny So if you know the answer, you can head on over to ohmygods.ca and submit your correct answer and then add in your contact information and t-shirt size. And if you get picked, you win a free t-shirt. Very cool, right? So continuing on next week with the creation of the gods and the world, now that we've laid out some of the primordial deities and their children, the next is to go over the children of Gaia and like that's a whole mess and then also introduce some of the grandchildren to keep moving on down the lineage if you like what you heard please feel free to follow subscribe rate and all the rest and if you're looking for info or deets check out ohmygods.ca for the reading slash watching list as well as the cheat sheet and any upcoming episodes well thanks again for listening okay bye